Welcome to CSC 410. This is our final item analysis for the last module. Woohoo! Um, we're going to walk through this quickly and review assessment items that prove to challenge for students. Uh, this was a 60 minute assessment. All seven students attempted the assessment. There were 20 possible questions, and each student had up to 60 minutes. The average score was lower than usual, 2.88, usually runs about three and a half. So uh, we're a little more than a half a point off the typical average score. Uh, difficulty spread was where we want it to be. Not too many easy or hard questions, but most are medium difficulty questions. There were a few that all students answered correctly and consistently because they all got it right. Blackboard interpreted this with its statistical analysis um, to be an issue, and that's because Blackboard uh, is it's not designed to take mastery learning into account. So if everybody got it right and everybody answered the same way, I would see them as cannot calculate or poor questions based on the discrimination criteria for the analysis. Anyway, we'll go ahead and blitz down through the most challenging issues, but then we'll stop and we'll skip over these last two because every student got these two items correct, and then we'll jump through the multi-answer and multi-ordering. We'll probably skip this one too, the Linux command, um, as nearly everyone got it correct. So, all right, without further ado, the first question that posed a challenge for students was a multiple choice question about virtual hard disk stores. You must configure optional or optimal, I'm sorry, optimal operating system resources to support the storage of dozens of large and fast virtual machines. Virtual hard disks must be created and stored in a certain manner. Select the answer below that represents the best solution. Format the array with the largest inode size possible. Create fixed VHDs for the virtual machines. That is the correct answer. It's explicitly stated in the study guide. What does that mean? Well, you're loading an entire virtual hard disk from a disk array in order to start up the virtual machine. This is kind of like downloading a Netflix high definition video. Three gigs large or 30 gigs large, larger the better. The question you have to ask yourself is, if the hard disks are formatted with very small inode sizes or allocation unit sizes, that's kind of like trying to deliver uh, 25 tons of Christmas goods with a Honda Civic instead of an 18-wheeler. So you're going to want to use the largest disk sector sizes or inode sizes or allocation unit sizes. You're going to want to use fixed VHDs, which means that um, it's going to pre-allocate that disk space and it'll be one continuous run of allocation units or one continu one contiguous series of uh, inodes. That's going to make for the most efficient uh, storage so that dozens of large and fast virtual machines can start up. Again, this is in your study guide. RAID Scenario A. This multi-answer question uh, posed a challenge. You are directed to configure enhancements for a file system that include true redundancy, protection against data corruption during power failures, and the ability to replace a bad disk without powering down the system, and improve read performance of the data files. Okay, so that criteria is very important. That would mean we would want to eliminate anything with uh, RAID 5. We couldn't use anything with RAID 0 because it doesn't have redundancy. So that's going to eliminate the last item. We can't use uh, 
dynamic disks and configure them in a RAID 1 array because that's software-based RAID. If we use a software-based disk controller, that's nowhere near as good as a hardware-based controller. An ARRAID 1 disk array with a global hot spare is what we'd really like. So our, our main concern isn't like performance, but it's true redundancy, protection against data corruption during power failures. A hardware-based RAID controller will also include uh, non-volatile memory so that as disk reads and writes are in progress, if there's a loss of power, uh, those transactions will be captured and then as soon as the system is powered back on, the transactions will write the rest of the data to the disk. It's an amazing thing. A software-based controller runs in RAM inside the operating system. It's not as fast, but more importantly, when the power fails, when the operating system crashes, all that data goes bye-bye. Hardware-based controller with non-volatile memory is the way to go. This information is in your addendum, or it's in the Special Topics RAID and uh, VM Special Topics for Virtual Machines. Okay, the third item that posed a challenge for students was about, it's another multi-answer item, not enough hard disk space. The question reads, you are tasked to enhance the file system of an important workstation that requires more space for the original OS volume. The physical machine can accommodate the installation and connection of a second hard disk. Here is an important consideration and limitation. Daily backups are, perf are currently performed to ensure essential resilience of important data. So you're not worried about, you know, whether or not um, there's a hard disk failure because you have backups. Moving or loading, reloading applications onto a second empty hard disk is not an option since the install media is no longer available. So you have an older system. Uh, it's important. Uh, you can't move the applications to a new hard disk you set up because, oh my gosh, um, you know, there's, there's no way to uh, migrate them without the install media. Right. As soon as you move all that application um, and dynamic uh, load link libraries, uh, link load link libraries, dynamic link libraries, DLLs, and application uh, executables uh, to another disk, it's not going to be able to find its way and it won't work. So what to do? You don't have enough hard disk space, but you can accommodate a second one. What's the solution? You can convert the basic disk used for the OS to a dynamic disk. Then you can add the second disk and then convert the new disk to a dynamic disk and span the new disk to the old disk. All you're doing is stitching it onto the end of the C drive. That way you just gain a lot of C drive space. No install media is needed. For the applications. You don't have to move the applications. All of a sudden, Daddy has a new pair of shoes, or Mama has a, what's the saying? Mama needs a new pair of red shoes. Anyway, um, that's an upgrade, and that's the best way to do it. If you use a RAID controller and configure RAID 1 with both disks, you wipe out the OS, you wipe out the install media when you reload it, you don't have media disks. If you install a RAID controller and configure, configure RAID 5, that doesn't help. You don't have enough uh, for that. You have an original hard disk and a second hard disk. RAID 5 requires at least three hard drives. If you convert the dynamic disk used for the OS volume to a basic disk, uh, that's not going to help. Well, the OS volume, when it's installed first, is already in a basic disk state, so that's a bogus answer. This information is in the special topics resources, and uh, there you have it.
It's a special case, but that's why they have dynamic disk options and spanning using software in the operating system. Least overhead. You must provide Linux CLI functionality to users on Windows hosts using the least resources so that basic Linux applications and data can be integrated with existing resources, meaning the existing resources are Windows workstations. Which option below is the best way to accomplish the criteria specified? Well, if you load Windows subsystem for Linux, so you have Windows hosts, but you have to be able to run Linux applications. This doesn't cost anything. If you buy a Samba client, each Samba client costs for every license used. Implementation of selected trusts, well, that integrated with existing resources, you'd have to have a whole new set of servers to set up a realm, a Linux realm. That is a best practice for a very large organization, but that's not the scenario we're talking about. And uh, use of Unity or seamless mode with a Linux virtual machine? Well, th that's not using um, existing resources either, uh, because what you're what you're doing is you are n what that'll do is that'll allow Linux applications to run inside the Linux virtual machines. And um, to be able to run Linux applications inside a Windows machine that where the Lin Linux application isn't in the Windows, basically what's happening is that you're running those things inside a separate host. It's not running in the Windows host. So even though you do integrate Linux with Windows with this last option, it doesn't meet the criteria of the scenario. The only way to make sure that Linux applications run on a Windows machine with uh, built-in existing resources is to install WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. It's in your study guide. Okay, IO component uh, will continue on until we get to this unit and then we'll jump down. IO component. This is a multiple choice item. You are directed to configure a server to maximize IO capacity on a Microsoft Windows Server 2022 storage solution. Server hardware includes a large multi-core server CPUs and four processor sockets. So you have a quad processor, you have a four by processor on the motherboard. We're not talking about cores. Each of the processors is multi-core. So let's say you have 16 cores for each processor and you have four processors, a terabyte of ECC RAM and two quad port, 10 gigabit ethernet, NIC interface cards. However, the hard disk controller embedded in the motherboard is a stock or standard component with basic RAID future features for SATA drives. So this is a server, but you're using desktop drives. The best solution is to install a PCIe SCSI RAID controller with direct memory access. This allows you to um, basically work very fast, uh, direct memory access to that terabyte of ECC SD RAM. So the disk array can talk directly to the RAM without working through the processors. It'll maximize the IO capacity of the system at the lowest cost. That hardware controller in a high performance expansion slot. I 
it cost a hundred dollars if that the other configurations that's not a high performance solution raid 5 raid 5 is a dog don't ever do it unless you're unless you have no resources you have no no resources to do raid correctly if you convert disks to dynamic and do software raid that's not a high performance scenario and it's going to basically offset the high performance hardware so that's not not desired configure a raid 10 san with iSCSI on both NICs. when you buy a san with raid 10 you're spending as much money as you did when you bought the server the idea was to do it at the lowest cost so this is twenty five thousand dollars and this might be 250 if you buy a really nice one with a brand name so that's a it's a hundred times cheaper All right framework for an organization The multiple choice question reads, you must select a file system and operating system and OS that includes a framework for the OS and applications to organize and access data files. What file system attribute provides this capability? Uh, in the textbook and in the study guide, it talks about indexing uh, capabilities in an operating system. And it's the indexing capabilities that allow for a uh, an operating system with logging or journaling attributes, right? So when the operating system has index attributes, then it can do journaling or audit and journal attributes. So those become possible when the OS has index capabilities, okay? So the file system attribute provides that is the index attribute of a file system. And then there are other enhancements that are possible. So a journaling operating system isn't possible unless the file system includes an index attribute. It's in your study guide in the textbook. multiple choice logging file system changes you must log the changes made to the file system and file system objects I'm talking about auditing or journaling a journaling operating system on a Windows system what enhanced file system feature must you enable for the selected FS objects to log such changes well it's not called journaling that's the concept for the design of an operating system. It's an operating system principle or concept, generically speaking. In Windows, it's called auditing. MFT and indexing are not what you need um, to be able to do that. Auditing is the correct answer. So when we're talking about operating system, file system attributes that make auditing capable that's index when we're talking about using it within a windows system that's called auditing moving right along multinational consortium here we go you have a large enterprise probably right it says multinational consortium right a multinational consortium of different organizations must share resources in a manner that allows for role-based access control in a mixed and open source operating system environment. That means you're going to have Windows, you're going to have Linux. The foundation of the enterprise file system context or schema is a scalable Active Directory solution. Note that the changes in individual and team access of file system resources that belong to the cons consortium must be managed to apply changes promptly in real time. So you might have somebody in one organization 
and uh, they're no longer with that organization and they have to make a quick change so that access across the consortium between organizations is suddenly and efficiently uh, changed in a coordinated and integrated manner. Which option provides the most robust, secure, and scalable uh, option to allow for the spontaneous and adaptive management of clients in this environment for efficient and secure operations? Um, a good comparison for this might be something like NATO, the Na North American Treaty, uh, North American, that's a defense uh, alliance treaty organization. Anyway. Uh, the European Union might be a good example. Very large organizations. Okay, so when you implement, if you want to integrate Linux and Windows, you can do it on a much uh, smaller level with built-in and free options like turning on Windows subsystem for Linux. But this isn't going to accomplish the criteria and the objective I mean, uh, specified in in the objective of this uh, assessment item. Only implementation of selective trust between domain forests and Linux realms is this considered a best practice for scalable, resilient uh, integration between organizations. The rest of these are performed on a host level, but not between hundreds of hosts across several organizations. That's the difference. On that scale, this is the only thing that's easy to maintain, the first option. There's an explanation for that in uh, the special topics. Which array solution? You have a disk array. You were hired to provide expertise to architect an innovative solution. Identical virtual machines will utilize the same 40 gigabyte hard drive disk so that 30 students in a computer science class can power on and perform tasks to provision file system resources in authentic scenarios. A high-speed local network connects the disk array used to run the VM, which solution will provide the best performance for this instructional interest. Well, a network attached store with file level access is your best option. If you use an iSCSI SAN, that's block level disk access, which means that as soon as the first student starts to power on the virtual machine, 29 other students have to wait until the first student is finished downloading that large 40 gig hard, hard disk file. However, the 20 year old file system or file level access across the network, right, the first NAS implementation from 20 years ago actually does a better job because as each student starts to uh, access their virtual machine, uh, they're not restricted because this is file level access. That means that the first student, second student, they can all simultaneously access that same file and start downloading it at the same time. iSCSI SANs are ideal when you're using a large server to host virtual machines that are production machines that will always be powered on and need a persistent hard drive for boot. In this case, we're talking about uh, incidental and on-demand use. We're not talking about high-performance data center stuff. So if you're going to implement a virtual machine host uh, for production servers, for virtual servers, uh, then iSCSI SAN with a blade server is the best way to go. If you're talking about an instructional scenario where all 30 students have to turn on those virtual machines all at once, it's the 20 year old NAS that does the better job. Uh, this is explained in your study guide and in the special topics. Moving right along, we're almost there. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, yep, we have from here to here to go yet. Okay, memory management hardware. If we're dealing with, if 
virtual memory and memory management. Hardware is used by the OS to ensure efficient memory management. Select the items below that are hardware components of efficient memory management. These other components are software based, but the memory management unit is literally a hardware component on the motherboard or in the chip, depending on the implementation. The relocation register is a specific hardware component that allows RAM to work more efficiently because it's uh, hard coded or hardwired as a component, physical component, to perform those tasks. So those are the two hardware components that are involved with efficient memory management. Access in a mixed OS environment. You must choose the use of a file system for a disk volume that must provide access to users working in a mixed operating system environment. Which choice below provides the most direct and efficient options? FAT32 or EXFAT. These are older style file systems. They don't include the advanced journaling and indexing attributes that NTFS, um, AFS, NFS is an old thing that doesn't have that, but that, that wouldn't do it. You, you can't use NFS across a network, but you don't format a disk with it. Use of EXT4, uh, that's Linux, but a lot of EXT4 you can't access from NTFS or even on some Macs depending on the nature of the Linux distribution. This is the universal file system format, the old as dirt legacy file format. And that's something that's explicitly stated in your study guide. Okay. Uh, You must recommend a file system enhancement that would improve resilience for systems that are used heavily and more exposed to hackers. Systems are not capable of hardware-based RAID and can use only one, one physical hard disk. Which option best meets these requirements given the operational limitations? Well, you're stuck. You can only have the one hard disk. You can't use RAID but you can convert the basic disk into a dynamic disk, which moves the boot sector to the end of the disk and creates redundant database uh, implementations of the file system. So it's resilient. Uh, so that is one option, and that's one reason why we have dynamic disk options in the Windows file system. I don't know if there's any dynamic disk equivalent in Linux or on the Mac OS X. Um, FCFS. First come, first serve. Disk scheduling algorithm is also known as an elevator method that improves disk read write efficiency. That is false. The elevator method has to do with the other two, um, other two methods. Virtual memory essentials. One matter related to the configuration of virtual memory is most important. Select the item below that best relates this essential matter. Poorly configured swap files cause thrashing that can damage hard disks. You can actually destroy a hard disk if you don't configure your virtual memory correctly. That's one reason why we ask you to walk through the steps and perform personalizing, optimizing your personal technology. The rest of these are bogus answers. And that 
bit about thrashing is in the special topics or study guide or both. Um, lost in Linux space. Multiple answer. A student is entering commands in a Linux terminal using an online reference to solve a problem about a time-sensitive situation. It becomes painfully obvious after five minutes of furious typing that the student has no idea what what directory is is now active for the prompt. And most commands do not work, returning file not found or command not found errors. The student concludes the most important thing is to determine the working active directory and to return back to the home directory. What steps or common practices are recommended to ensure the most sensible and efficient recovery for this common situation? Well, first you type in PWD to see where you are, and then you type in CD space tilde. That's the shift uh, hash mark in the upper left corner near the escape key. Um, if you enter this command to return <laughs> to your home directory that's actually going to delete everything on your system and uh, you don't want to move files there either so these last two entries are completely bogus we're almost done in fact we are done uh, the only thing we have to do now is to jump down to these final items otherwise these were nearly uh, um, answered completely correct by all students these two well this one was and then uh, that's why we covered it these two were the multiple answer and ordering are the only thing that are left the students really had um, a challenge with this multiple answer item you are required to enhance the file system capabilities of a critical system. So this is a mission critical system, probably a big server. You need to ensure the very best read and write disk performance and must include redundancy. So performance and redundancy are ultimately the most important thing. What components below will ensure these requirements are met? Okay, you're going to stripe, you're going to mirror, and you're going to do RAID 1-0. So RAID 1-0 is actually striping and mirrored. Um, so when you set the disk set to striped and mirrored, you are configuring a RAID 1-0 array for better performance and redundancy. That's part of the process. Um, the other two bogus answers were the disk must include parity. That's a RAID 5 implementation whenever you're using parity for redundancy. That's a very slow, very tedious, algorithmic, um, what's an algorithm-based solution. It's done in software. Uh, there's a calculation. It's not, not, uh, not, perform, not performance oriented whatsoever. So it says a RAID disk, a RAID 5 disk must be configured for better performance and redundancy. Uh, that gets back to the same thing. RAID 5 uses a parity disk. We're basically saying the same thing here. You don't want to use RAID 5 or a parity disk to do this. Last item, which is an ordering assessment item steps to perform role-based access control for resilient granular access to file system resources. Step one, adopt a sensible naming convention based on the role. Now, you don't want to use anything with spaces, special characters. You don't want long, long paths. Step two, create, a direct, create directories and groups or a directory and a group using the same sensible name. So there's going to be a one-to-one -one correlation between the group that's accessing the directory with the resources 
That's the whole point. It's the first step. Disable default permissions. Once you get that set up, you're going to have to go in there and turn off inheritance because the root directory of the C drive is going to push down that all users have read and execute privileges and authenticated users actually have modify privileges. So anybody that properly logs onto that system can modify the data files. It's terrible. Fourth step, you're going to remove default permissions, rights that do not reflect the assigned role. So once you disable inheritance, then you can remove the default permissions. And you're going to assign the minimum permissions required to perform the role only related to that group. So notice we're assigning the minimum permissions to the related group, not to the individual. We're going to select the box that says replace all child object permission entries with inheritable permissions from this object. Basically, you're turning back on inheritance with that directory you just created so that anything new inside that's built or changed will also retain those things. That's the resilient part. You're going to assign the user account so users that need to perform that role are not directly assigned those permissions. Instead, the user account is added to the group. And when their roles change, you just change group membership. And their access follows with them. It is the easiest thing in the world to maintain. And it's very persistent. It uh, provides granular access. You have great control over uh, all, all manner and scale of, of directory resources in an operating system. That's what you perform um, in part in your solution. You do RBAC, um, but you're doing it with a standalone or work group security account uh, management model don't have a domain so you can't you're basically using the account assignments directly in our solution if, uh, if you're interested in extra credit we could set the stage for you to perform the same steps in a domain environment so you can see how this works this concludes our item analysis of our last module assessment good luck with the, the retake uh, of this the alternate version of this assessment and with your final exam. Goodbye for now.